There aren't too many jobs, professions, or even inventions that would make someone a billionaire. But hedge funds created by industry pioneers such as Stephen A. Cohen did just that. And according to former hedge fund analyst Sheila Kolhatkar, the rise of that industry has reshaped Wall Street and its influence on the economy and beyond. Now a staff writer at The New Yorker, Sheila Kolhatkar's new book is called Black Edge, Inside Information, Dirty Money, and the quest to bring down the most wanted man on Wall Street. And she joins us now from New York, New York. Sheila, it's great to meet you. I so enjoyed this book. It is just, I mean, it reads like a whodunit. And let me just read an excerpt from it to get us started here. Here's from your book, Black Edge. It would be an investigation unlike any other in the history of Wall Street. A decade-long, multi-agency government crackdown on insider trading focused almost entirely on hedge funds. It quickly expanded to ensnare corporate executives, lawyers, scientists, traders, and analysts across dozens of companies. Its ultimate target was Stephen Cohen, the billionaire founder of SAC Capital Advisors, possibly the most powerful hedge fund firm the industry had ever seen. Okay, let's tell the story. The man at the center of all this, Stephen Cohen. Who is he? Well, so he was and continues to be a legendary figure in the financial world. He amassed a personal fortune of well over $10 billion, almost entirely uh, on his own steam as sort of like a wizard-like stock trader. He came from humble, very middle-class roots uh, in Long Island, close to New York City. He went to Wharton, where a lot of uh, big business people go here. And he uh, ended up his formative years at a really scrappy brokerage firm in Lower Manhattan. And then in 1992, he started a hedge fund, SAC Capital. And um, the hedge fund industry was in its infancy or perhaps its early adolescence at that time. This was like a new type of investment vehicle where, uh, you know, in exchange for agreeing to manage the money of only of wealthy investors who could afford to potentially lose the money, hedge funds were given a lot of flexibility by regulators. They were allowed to borrow money. They were allowed to short stocks, which is sort of a risky activity. They were allowed to do almost any kind of investing that they wanted and take a lot of risk. And, um, you know, Steve Cohen kind of rode this industry as it exploded and grew and became incredibly powerful. And um, in 2013, who's at his, his peak, uh, well over $10 billion in you his fund. So. You point out in the book that almost uh, from his teenage years on, he just had some kind of crazy ability to read the numbers better and differently from anybody else. Do you, do you understand what that talent was? Well, so people used to describe him as a tape reader, and it's a bit of a strange thing. I mean, it basically meant, you know, before uh, the whole trading mechanism was electronic, there was a physical ticker tape, and you could sit there and look at orders coming in and out of the market, and he was, according to people who worked with him, very, very good at this. He could sort of scan the market. He could look at all the available news and information about a particular stock. And then he could just sit there in front of his screens and make a lot of money trading, almost like what we think of as day trading now. So it was a certain amount of natural talent uh, and intuition. But of course, there were people who were skeptical that he was as good as people said. But this was his reputation on Wall Street. Well, here are some of the numbers. In 2006, the CEO of Goldman Sachs, which everybody's heard of, made $54 million. Now that sounds like a lot of money, but you also tell us the lowest earner of the top 25 hedge fund managers in that same year made $240 million, and the top three made north of a billion dollars in one year. Uh, I, I guess just a little tangent here, but wh why so much focus on the Goldman Sachs's of the world uh, and not on these guys who are clearly playing in an even higher league? Well, this is part of why I thought the story of this book was really important, because this industry, the hedge fund industry, has grown up. It now manages, uh, by some estimates, $3 trillion globally. And um, the people running the most successful hedge funds are amassing unprecedented personal fortunes. I mean, really, on a scale we haven't seen since the robber baron, you know, Andrew Carnegie days. And they are doing this through financial speculation, moving money around, taking money, turning it into more money by kind of speculating in the market. They create relatively few jobs. Uh, many of them in the U.S. pay lower taxes than a salaried employee, a secretary, uh, due to lobbying and various loopholes. And, um, you know, they take a lot out of the system. So I just think it's important for people to pay attention to what they're doing. They're lightly regulated. They're constantly fighting against increased uh, regulation and transparency. But it's a really remarkable thing. And, and they really have the ability now to influence uh, political 
uh, candidates and policy in Washington. They had just have so, so much money. Now, of course, the big question is, was Stephen Cohen as good as he was because he was just good or because he you know, snuggle up close to the line or cross the line. Did you come to any conclusions about that? Well, it's hard to say for sure because people have different opinions about this. I mean, he was clearly very aggressive and pushed his people very, very hard. So, um, you know, he was quite clever the way he structured SAC, his hedge fund. You know, it was, it was made up of different groups, trading groups. There would be a portfolio managing a group of traders and analysts, and they were all separate from each other. And all these little pods were competing with one another. And they were um, responsible for giving their best trading ideas sort of up the food chain to Steve Cohen himself. And he, uh, he was a very aggressive, involved trader. He sat at the center of the firm's trading floor. He wanted to know everything that was going on. And, you know, he's just personally obsessed with the market. He really was not interested in being off in an office taking meetings. He wanted to be right in there trading. So these guys were feeding him ideas. And um, to some extent, he was a bit insulated from what was going on. So he was really pushing them to get good sort of monetizable ideas. And uh, some people believe he pushed them too hard. You know, he was offering them enormous bonuses if they brought back good trading ideas. But, you know, it would get sort of filtered through layers of compliance and, you know, different emails. And uh, by the time it got to him, he, you know, he didn't necessarily know where they had gotten the information. Well, let's so. do one example of, of one of his protégés, and that is a guy named Matthew Martoma, who had a sort of an inside track on a drug that potentially could cure Alzheimer's disease. Tell us more about Matthew. Well, so he was um, a very accomplished, pedigreed uh, portfolio manager. Steve Cohen hired around 2006. He'd been uh, to Stanford Business School. He'd been to Duke. He'd had all sorts of fancy internships. He was like a very high-level, impressive guy, the sort of person who, at another time, might have chosen to go into medicine, but instead, best and the brightest, he's, he's beelining into the hedge fund world to try and make a lot of money. And... Um, you know, he was tracking the development of, of an Alzheimer's drug that was being uh, tested by two publicly traded pharmaceutical companies. And his idea was that if he made the correct bet on the outcome of this drug trial, he could make a lot of money for SAC, for Steve Cohen, and for himself. So um, ultimately, over a period of months, uh, according to the government's allegations against him, he um, cultivated a source of inside information about this drug trial. It was an elderly physician, like Dr. Sidney Gilman, an esteemed Alzheimer's researcher, uh, you know, very high level figure at the University of Michigan Medical Department, the sort of person who would speak at conferences. And Dr. Gilman was involved in this drug trial. So over time, Martoma is alleged to have kind of corrupted Dr. Gilman. And ultimately, in 2008, he got access to this confidential drug trial result the week before it was made public. And this was a really big deal because these stocks were very dependent on the outcome of this trial. By getting this information before any other investors in the market, uh, you know, the government alleged he was able to help SAC Capital make $275 million in ill-gotten profits. So the largest insider trading case we have ever seen. Uh, and I'm not going to give away what, you know, how he found it out and all that. We'll leave that for the readers to, to discover. But I, I did find that one of the, well, perhaps the single most interesting thing about Martoma's background was what his father gave him after his father found out that he was not going to get into Harvard, the son. Tell us about that. Well, so um, it's, it's a sad story for me, honestly. I mean, Martoma's parents uh, immigrated to the United States from India. They were very hard working. His mother was a, a physician. Um, very hard working immigrant parents who really wanted their children to achieve academically. And they pushed Martoma very, very hard. I mean, nothing short of straight A's was acceptable. And, um, you know, you kind of got a glimpse of this as the story started to come out and the Martoma case unfolded. But yes, after after just trying so hard all through high school, he got top grades. He was a merit scholar. He had all these incredible internships and volunteer opportunities. He failed to get into Harvard. He got into Duke, which is also a very, very exceptional college. But his father was apparently very, very upset, had a personal desire for his son to go to Harvard and ended up giving him a plaque saying, you know, this is to, to the son who broke his father's heart. And, you know, reading that later, it really helped explain, perhaps, a bit of what had gone wrong with Martoma. And it was just a sad story, honestly. 
Sheila, let's focus now on the investigation around Stephen Cohen. Clearly, he was the big fish that the authorities wanted to get. They, I guess like sharks, started to eat away at the smaller prey that was around him. But he was always the main target. And I wonder, given how complicated his business is, and that he knew it so much better than they did, did the authorities ever really have a shot at getting him? Well, this is really where I think the story of uh, Mr. Cohen is the story of our time, because we do seem to live in an era where the people at the very top, especially in the financial and business world, rarely pay a price in terms of being prosecuted for crimes that occur at their companies. This happened with the financial crisis. We saw uh, no senior executives or bankers charged with any crimes pertaining to the frauds uh, that involved involved in that crisis. And it was similar with this hedge fund investigation. I mean, this, this went on for years. Uh, the authorities gathered all sorts of evidence that they thought linked Mr. Cohen to insider trading that was going on at his firm. He was clearly making money from the activities of his employees. But in the end, they were unable to make a case against him that they felt was rock solid that they could take to a jury. And they frankly were scared of losing. Uh, there are some critics who believe they did not try hard enough. And, um, you know, I think it really speaks to a lot of the inequality that we see in the system now, because there is sort of this two-tiered system. If you're a high enough level person, a very wealthy individual, it is increasingly unlikely that you will face any type of prosecution. So. Well, it's not like he got off scot-free. I mean, they did, they did nab him for $2 billion in fines, uh, and, um, and he had to sort of make a public acknowledgement, or his lawyer did anyway, that, that, that they, you know, had a culture of malfeasance there. Uh, but at the end of the day, not only did they not get him, he didn't even show up for court. How did he manage to avoid all that? Remarkable. Yeah, so, well, so there was this very dramatic scene that I describe in the book, you know, after it was years of investigation and the press was feverishly covering the case and, you know, Steve Cohen, this iconic figure on Wall Street, is the government going to take him down? You know, it was so dramatic. And uh, over the summer of 2013, as I was reporting the book, um, you know, the government, the U.S. attorney in Manhattan had to make a decision. Are they going to charge one of the titans of finance with a crime? You know, everyone wanted to know. And Steve Cohen, of course, had the best lawyers that money could buy. He had this elite team of defense lawyers, and they went down to the U.S. attorney's office, and they made this big presentation. It lasted four hours. Uh, and they basically made the argument to the government investigators that... Um, you know, Mr. Cohen had not read a critical email that was part of their evidence. They said, well, he just he doesn't remember reading the email. And uh, they said, you just don't have what you need to convict him. You don't have a witness. And this was true, of course. They didn't have a witness who would testify against Steve Cohen. They did not have a wiretap that revealed he knew uh, he had gotten inside information. He traded on it. They did not have literally the smoking gun piece of evidence that would definitively show and, um, you know, the government left this big meeting and the prosecutors all huddled together. And although I think many of them felt in their hearts that he was on some level guilty of something, they had to acknowledge they just did not have the evidence. So uh, they went to their plan B and they indicted his company instead. So they charged SAC itself with insider trading. Uh, the U.S. attorney called it a uh, magnet for market cheaters, which is a pretty mm -hmm. colorful term. And this was still a very big deal, and um, Steve Cohen had to pay almost $2 billion in fines to resolve the case. And of course, I'm sure it was very embarrassing and stressful for him. But still, a lot of people look at that and they feel unsatisfied. They feel like, you know, the guy who made most of the money from all this activity is still there. In fact, he still has over $10 billion. And remarkably, uh, this fine he paid, it barely made a dent in his lifestyle. Which did, is stunning. Did these fines and or convictions of any of his underlings uh, actually change fundamentally at all the way hedge fund operators did their thing? Well, so this uh, series of cases did generate a lot of attention. Uh, the, the media was sort of obsessed with them and covering them. And I know that a lot of other hedge funds certainly paid attention and took notice. And I think many of them did start to try and tighten up their compliance a little bit. But what's remarkable at the end of all this is there was sort of a series of appeals court rulings and um, one of Steve Cohen's former traders who had been convicted saw his conviction reversed. And in fact, the appeals court made it even a little more difficult to prosecute this sort of crime. So in a way, it's a little frustrating at the end, you know, if this is something you really care about because um, 
you know, they went to all this effort. And there's certainly a debate going on now about whether it was really worth it. Has Wall Street really reformed itself? Um, it does not seem like it has, based on my reading of the situation. I mean, you still see insider trading cases uh, coming along. There's a tremendous amount of lobbying going on against regulation. And I just think it's important for people to remember, um, you know, what happens when uh, regulation starts to get pulled back. I mean, bad behavior starts to spread pretty quickly. Hmm. You tried on numerous occasions to get Stephen Cohen to cooperate with you and speak to you for this book, but at the end of the day, he consistently declined. Um, do you know if he's read the book? It's a good question. I don't know. Um, I have not heard from him since it came out. I, I certainly tried very hard to speak with him, but realistically, I, I knew that it was unlikely his lawyers would allow him to cooperate on this kind of big investigative book project when, at the same time, he was refusing to go and testify uh, to a grand jury. So, you know, I knew that was a long shot, but um, this is what investigative journalism is for. And, um, you know, I thought it was a story of really public significance and importance, and people need to see how the justice system works. They need to see how Wall Street works. And, um, you know, it's a really significant series of cases, so. I don't want to read too much into one interaction, but, but I think in your last interaction with him, you approached him at an art auction, and you asked him if he was a buyer or a seller, and he, of course, said, I'm a seller, of course. And then he went and spent $140 million buying something. So he, your last interaction with him was a lie. Um, any chance to follow up on that with him afterwards? Well, well, I thought that that kind of coda to the story was just about perfect because there he was. I saw him at the Christie's auction house. I'd gone there intentionally to try one last time to kind of talk to him for my book. And, um, you know, he kind of came in. He looked he looked very relaxed. He was tanned. You know, the legal cloud had mostly lifted from him and he'd been spending a lot of time trying to kind of distance himself from the scandal. He really wants to cleanse his reputation and be seen as like a good guy and a pillar of society. And yes, he arrived, he was there to sell a, a famous piece of art from his art collection. He's a, he's a prominent art collector, as many hedge fund moguls are. And um, yeah, of course, his parting words to me were that he was only there to sell. And then he went and bought this $140 million sculpture. And I just thought that was just about perfect. I mean, there he is at his uh, back in the game. And, um, you know, he was trying to show the world that the government did not manage to really dent him at all. Hmm. Multi-billionaires, of course, can do all sorts of things to give them a patina of legitimacy. They create charitable foundations and they give away lots of money to public institutions. Uh, can you tell us a bit about what Stephen Cohen has done in that regard? Well, and he, he has been active in philanthropy for sure. Um, he's very passionate about veterans' health, for example. His son uh, served in the Marines. So he has, he's done a lot to sponsor uh, health care for veterans. He spent a lot in local um, Connecticut hospitals, children's charities. He's not as flashy about his um, charitable activity as some people. I mean, his name is not on the front of, uh, you know, any big like museum or opera house in New York. Um, but I know that he does, you know, people locally in the community see him and his wife as very generous benefactors. And um, who, you know, who wouldn't be if, if, uh, if I had $10 billion, I would certainly enjoy, um, you know, helping, helping my pet causes. I think that's a really wonderful thing. And, and uh, yeah, I have the sense that he's sort of increased some of that to try and, um, you know, show to people that he does good in the world. I think that matters to him, so. Hmm. Sheila, now that yeah. you've spent years looking at both him and the hedge fund industry in general and Wall Street's behavior and the Great Recession and so on, have you been able to come to what you think is sort of, quote unquote, the moral of the story? Well, um, I, I try to connect it to the bigger picture of what's going on right now. So we're, we're entering a period here where um, deregulation fever is taking over. You know, deregulation and tax cutting, those are the two big things going on in Washington right now. And there seem to be big plans uh, in the Trump administration to really water down the financial regulations that were put in place after the financial crisis, to kind of pull back on all sorts of rules that banks and Wall Street firms didn't like to cut their taxes significantly. And I think it's just really important to remember that the last time we saw a lot of that kind of activity, it happened, you know, really between 2000, 2008, um, that was a real period of deregulation here. The SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, which is responsible for, uh, responsible for policing the markets, 
was run by someone who uh, thought that Wall Street could regulate itself. And it did not work out so well. I mean, basically, during that time, we had an enormous uh, subprime mortgage bubble inflate into the, you know, and blew up into the financial crisis. And we had all this insider trading at hedge funds just spreading like crazy. And um, it really it culminated in the 2008, 2009 kind of economic meltdown here. And I think it's important for people to remember that when people are not watching and people are dealing with huge amounts of money, um, really bad behavior can spread. So smart regulation is really important. And I wonder why, just as a follow up, you think that so many politicians are so, and I don't know what the right word is here, uh, unwilling or afraid or whatever, to actually put some serious regulations in place to make sure that the person who lives on Main Street doesn't get screwed over by the people who work on Wall Street. Well, so I, 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 that's a source of real frustration to me because uh, honestly, a lot of um, this is why people are so uh, frustrated and unhappy with Congress because most of the representatives there are not serving the interests of their voters. They are serving the interests of the very well off donors and lobbyists who have put them in their jobs. So um, it's a real problem because what we've seen over the last few years is increasing amounts of activity here in, in our economy are devoted to financial speculation. Uh, that is where all the kind of the best and the brightest people are flocking to try and make a lot of money. And other parts of the economy are withering. And um, although politicians like to talk about how this is a problem and Main Street is suffering, you often see them then going and passing legislation that their wealthy benefactors uh, have designed for them. And um, I think it is a reflection of the fact the system is kind of broken here. Hmm. Let's finish up on this. You point out in the book that before you got into journalism, you were actually in this game. Do you have any regrets that you didn't stay in the game because you would clearly be a whole hell of a lot richer today financially had you done so? Indeed, I, I really, um, it's hard to explain why I would go <laughs> to choose to make so much less money than I was making before. But, um, you know, I found my time working in the hedge fund world to be really interesting. Honestly, I felt like an anthropologist kind of studying this really fascinating environment. And, um, you know, it was fun and uh, I learned a lot. However, um, I was not well suited to that kind of work. I was an analyst at a small hedge fund. Uh, basically, it involved every day going and kind of making trading decisions based on imperfect information. You had to make quick decisions all day long. You're trading with other people's money, your investors' money. I found that to be really stressful. I am a cautious kind of nerd. I like to study everything really well. I, I'm the person who studies more than anyone else for the test. There, you're just having to kind of make quick decisions all day long, win money, lose money, and just not be rattled by it. And I was really unhappy. So hmm. that seemed like a good reason <laughs> well, to leave. Well, I'm glad you got out, if only because it made you write this book, which I was so happy to read. Black Edge, Inside Information, Dirty Money, and the Quest to Bring Down the Most Wanted Man on Wall Street. Sheila Kolhatkar, it's great of you to be with us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.